If you'd like to follow along with the uh, sermon this morning, you can turn to Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians. Um, over in uh, 1 Timothy, though, in chapter 4, Paul says to Timothy, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. And I always get something more out of the Bible when I read it. Um, no matter how many times you read it, you get some kind of insight. You get some kind of question to ponder. You get some kind of encouragement. Um, and so what I want to do with a short letter like Ephesians, before we get into exhortation and teaching, is uh, just to read through it once. Uh, that's one of the ways I'd like to serve the congregation here is to read the letter of Ephesians. So if you want to follow along, I'm going to start in chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us, in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not your own doing. 
It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift, Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? 
but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord, and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Plenty of stuff that we could talk about this morning. Uh, Brother Derek asked me how long I want to speak. I want to talk about all of this, but we're not going to do that this morning. I want to focus... Um, on chapter 4, looking at some things in chapter 4, looking at verse 17, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord. I want to pause there for a second and just ask, uh, does that phrase sound a little bit awkward to you like it does to me? Um, is Paul being redundant when he says both say and testify? I just want to think through this for a quick moment. If he's not being redundant, then what's 
the difference between saying and testifying. If I asked you to say the truth, how would you do that? Probably with words, right? Say the truth. You're going to tell me something. Now, what if I asked you to testify to the truth? How would you do that? We well, could use words, right? In the same way that you would say the truth. You could use words as you testify. But what else could you use? Say, like in a court of law, to testify to the truth. You could use physical evidence, couldn't you? Part of the testimony that's given are tangible things that people can see, that people can observe, that will accord with or corroborate what someone has said is the truth. And I think that Paul has both of these things in mind here. As he says, I say and testify, right, in the Lord. And so although these two terms, say and testify, they have some overlap with each other, I think that's the distinction that Paul is bringing to our minds as he uses both of these words. He's telling us that he's providing both verbal and physical evidence to the truth. Now, the next question is uh, evidence of what truth? What is the thing that he's saying and testifying? Well, in the immediate, most immediate context here, verse 17, what he's saying and testifying is that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do and the futility of their minds. So, Paul is saying a number of things here. That you, being the saints, being those that have been saved by grace through faith, those that are baptized into Christ, the reality is, Paul is saying, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. What's another word for Gentiles? How are we to understand that? There were Jews and Gentiles, right? They were the people of God and everybody else, basically, right? That word, as they used it in the, the Old Covenant, it meant nations. There was the nation of Israel, and then there were the nations. And so Paul is saying that as members of the kingdom of God, you must no longer walk as the nations do, right? And remember, he's saying this, but he's also testifying to it, so we'll get to that. But the other thing that he says is he explains to us the way that the nations walk. He says that they do so in the futility of their minds. Maybe one more quick uh, definition here. What does it mean to be futile or uh, for something to have futility? Um, it means senseless or vain, right? Uh, that idea that um, possibly Solomon is relaying in Ecclesiastes right? Um, a mere breath, uh, a vapor. But I think maybe one of the words that we use today in our common vernacular is that it's worthless, that it's pointless. He's saying that the nations walk in the worthless ideas of their minds. We as Christians, however, should be walking in a way that is worthy. Um, Paul's going to say that in verse 1 of chapter 4. In verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So there's worthiness or worth versus futility or worthlessness, right? Um, now, as to this whole saying and testifying bit, we see this idea here, that there is a calling, there is something that has been said, and that is meant to um, accomplish or encourage or empower uh, a worthy walk, right? Visible, tangible testimony. That's what our obedience is. Um, and so... As we read through chapters 1 through 3, Paul was talking about the calling that we've been called with. Chapters 1 through 3 are the calling. 4 through 6 are the worthy walk. 
Another way to think about that is maybe chapters 1 through 3 are the benefits of the gospel, and chapter 4 through 6 is the responsibility that we have according to those benefits, right? But what is the calling exactly? Because did you hear as we were reading together, Paul is saying, I want you to understand the gospel. I want you to have insight into this mystery of the gospel of Christ. We've been called to something. We know who we've been called by. But what did God have in mind when he called us? What is his purpose? It's said in a number of ways, but I'll just offer two. Going back to chapter 1, and look at verse 6. This is the calling that we're meant to walk worthy of. Uh, There we go. Verse 6 says, To the praise of his glorious grace. Verse 12 says, So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory, referring to the Jews. Um, And then in verse 14, he switches to the Gentiles and says, Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the purpose of the church, is to be to the praise of God's glory. Not to the praise of our glory. Not even, and this is maybe a a kind of a funny phrase, not to the praise of the glory of his church, but the church is to be to the praise of his glory, right? So as we work through that, um, keep, it in, keep it in mind that that is the purpose for which we are here in doing all that we're doing. One more stop I want to make before we start to get um, into more practical things is over in chapter 3, uh, one of the ways that Paul speaks about us being to the praise of God's glory is verse 10, uh, starting verse 9. Um, and he's talking about how he wants to bring to light for everyone, bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers, authorities, and the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we think about um, what God gets from us, what God's intention is in saving us, it doesn't get any bigger than this. This is, Paul says, the uh, eternal purpose where is it? I lost my place. The eternal purpose. The eternal purpose. This is the thing that God always had in mind when he decided that he was going to create us, a creature, for which he was going to have to send his son who would sacrifice his life and be raised from the dead and give us the Holy Spirit. It was all so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. Now here's something interesting. Um, I didn't notice this myself. Someone pointed this out to me, and ever since, it's really changed the way that I've thought about my salvation, and I've thought about my relationships with my brothers and sisters in the kingdom, um, a.k.a. the church. You notice who the manifold wisdom of God is being made known to? In verse 10, it says might now be made known to the rulers and authorities where? Well, in the heavenly places. Rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. If there are rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, do they not already know the manifold wisdom of God? Are they not there standing before him? When you look in places like Revelation, which Ephesians is basically Paul's revelation, don't they know? Don't, don't they see better than we can see? 
that God is wise? Well, maybe it depends who you're talking about. Because there are rulers or authorities in the heavenly places, is the terminology that Paul uses, um, that would disagree with God's glory. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 2, Paul uses another term here. The prince, I'm sorry, uh, verse 2 of chapter 2. The prince of the power of the air. Prince, that's a ruler, right? The power of the air, that's a heavenly place. It's spiritual planes, right? And Satan is an accuser, right? He disagrees that God is wise. He disagrees that God is love. He disagrees with these things, and he tries to get us to abandon our belief of that, right? Another witness to this is over in chapter 6, when Paul uses that terminology again of rulers and such. In verse 12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So it's through the church that God is putting on display his manifold wisdom, not just for people around us, but we're actually in this spiritual war that we're showing to God through our worthy walk of the calling that God is manifoldly, that's not a word, but God is wise. God is the most wise. What that does for me It just helped me to understand God's glory. It helps me to understand the mission of the church and to value it, that there is nothing beyond the church that God um, is going to do. Um, So with that being said, we should understand that there is great importance in the way that we walk. Um, which is why Paul begins in verse 17, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. We have to understand uh, God's grace. We have to keep learning. We have to keep growing in that, right? We as Christians should be walking in a way that praises God. Um, Okay, so I want to go back to the saying and testifying aspect here for a second. When we, um, when we say that God is wise, right, we do that according to his word. Uh, we can share scripture with people. We can uh, teach people, you know, with our words that God is wise. But the physical evidence or the testimony of that is how we walk, right? So verses 17 and 20. Uh, 17, we've read a number of times. I'll go to verse 20. He says, um, after explaining the way that the nations walk or those that don't know Christ walk, he says, that is not the way that you learned Christ. There's a, there's a subtle point here. He talks way, about the way that they're living, about the way that they're walking. And he says that there's a message there, Right? They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God. They have hardness of heart. They're callous. They've given themselves up to sensuality. They're greedy. Uh, They practice every kind of impurity. There's a message being proclaimed in that, which is why Paul can say, that is not the way you learned Christ. Um, Three scriptures here that I just want to attached to this idea here in Ephesians. In Isaiah chapter 52, uh, verses 1 through 11, uh, sorry, 1 through through 15, um, the prophet Isaiah says there, awake, Awake, put on your strength, O Zion, put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem, 
Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now therefore, what I have, uh, excuse me, now therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing. Their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice, together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go in flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Hopefully, um, in reading those 15 verses, you can see uh, some context connections there. Um, and in the midst of that passage, um, Isaiah says in verse uh, 5 that... Continually, all the day, my name is despised in the ESV. Um, that gets quoted over in uh, Romans, that all day long, his name is blasphemed, right? Because of the way that Israel had lived, the nations around them were saying, well, they're cheaters, they're liars, they're immoral, their God must be immoral too. Right? They claim that that's who they follow. They claim that that's why they are who they are. So I guess that's who he is. Right? Um, and there are all these exhortations around there uh, to, through the Lord's servant, uh, come out of that. Right? Um, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4, is the, the second passage that I want to uh, look at. Uh, starting in 1 of chapter 10, 2 Corinthians, verse 1, I, Paul, myself entreat you, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So there's a saying and there's a testimony here. This completed obedience, right, is effective. It shows God's wisdom. Um, and so both parts are important. I think that point is clear. And I'm just kind of showing that this is at the core of a lot of um, our New Testament here. Uh, even over to Revelation, Revelation 13, this will be the third and final passage that I want to connect to that thought in chapter 4. Starting <clears throat> Revelation 13, chapter 5. And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. 
It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. So when we think about blasphemy, um, I doubt that our struggle as Christians um, is saying things that are outright blasphemous, right? I don't think our struggle with with um, pr- being to the praise of God's glory is mostly about what we say. But do we often think about what we do, the way that we live, or maybe the things that we don't do, the things that we are failing to do, as giving an opportunity for blasphemies to be raised up against God, right? So that's kind of the, the first point, and, and just a little bit um, said about the calling that we're called to, um, what the weight of that is. Um, we're blessed that God has you know, called us in this way and that we can be effective um, by his grace in praising his glory, right? Some of Paul's uh, exhortations are going to come as we switch back to Ephesians, are going to come in chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 25. So we'll get there in a minute. Let me just catch up with myself here. When we walk worthy of the calling, we praise God. When we walk in an unworthy or worthless or futile manner, we blaspheme God. We've got to understand that, right? Verse 17, Paul talks about the way that the nations walk, that we need to be careful to not walk like. And going back to this idea of futility, right? Does, does Paul say that the Gentiles are the way that they are because they're just filled up with all these evil thoughts that all day long they go to the library or they go on the internet and they search how to be evil, how to be as evil as I can, right? Oh, I didn't know that, right? Maybe they go down to uh, their local prison and, and meet with somebody on death row and say, hey, you know, what, what were your plans? Did you get to do all the evil that you wanted to do, right? Do you have some that you could share with me? Okay, let me write that down. Let me commit myself to that and try to figure out how to be more evil. No, that's not what he says, right? He says futility, just kind of things that maybe seem benign, to seem to be harmless, but it's what they're full of. It's a barrier to the insight. It's a barrier to, um, yeah, the the understanding that Paul uh, says, like in verse 4, chapter 3, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. If we're not committing to getting deeper into Uh, the gospel, right? It's probably because we're just paying attention and perceiving worthless things, right? And because of that, he says in verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding. Well, if we're not searching to know, if we're not seeking uh, enlightenment through God's word, then we're going to remain darkened, right? And this is a choice. Paul's saying, don't walk like this. And so we've got to make this choice and understand that we're susceptible to this, right? Um, all right. I promised I wasn't going to try to talk about all of it, and I'm kind of feeling myself trying to get, you know, take on too much here. Um, so let me just get us to the practical part of the lesson where we'll end. Um, starting in verse 22, there's a little bit of a a framework that Paul is going to use for his exhortations. He says in verse 22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. That's the first thing he's going to tell us to do is to put off something. He's then going to say in verse 23, to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And in verse 24, he's going to say, to put on the new self. So you can skim through verses 25 through 32 quickly and just look for that pattern. Put off, put on. 
by the renewal of your minds, right? All right, so let's go through some of these. Verse 25, therefore, sorry, I want to say one more thing real quick. Um, do you ever wonder, like me, like, what's the big deal? Um, what's the bigger picture? What does it matter if I fall short, if I sin in this particular way? God has said that it's wrong. Um, and we can say things like, what if I'm bitter? So what if I'm bitter? Right? I know God has said it's wrong, but why has he said it's wrong? What is he expressing through that? You know, God wants us to understand his grace better than we do today. His grace will allow us to understand why bitterness has the potential to uh, blaspheme him. Why bitterness gives an opportunity for those rulers and authorities, those evil powers in the heavenly places to say to God, you're not wise, you're not worthy, you're not glory, uh, glorious, right? Um, and so Ephesians is a letter that can help us better understand that, to connect the behavior to the bigger picture by the renewal of our minds. Um, cool. Okay, so verse 25. What is it that Paul says we're supposed to put off or put away? Falsehood. Yeah, we're to put away falsehood. And so what is it in the next line that we're meant to put on? Speaking the truth. Right. And then he says for or because. Here's why. Here's the bigger picture. For we are members one of another. So I just want to go through a couple of these and just talk about that here for a second. Um, falsehood. Falsehood. Um, I heard someone give the example once that we walk into our church doors and we're catching up with each other, and someone asks, hey, how's everything going? Um, or maybe they ask in more direct words, like, how's your spiritual life, right? And what's our inclination? What's our kind of gut, uh, knee-jerk reaction? I'm fine, I'm good, things are okay, right? And they very well could not be. It could be that, hey, I'm really been struggling with uh, anxiety. I've really been struggling with anger. I've really been struggling. I've, I've got this coworker that's just been getting under my skin. I've, I've been bitter toward them lately, right? Um, why do we rely on falsehood? Well, maybe to avoid some kind of shame. If we're trying to avoid that, what we're really doing is we're propping ourselves up trying to make ourselves look better than we actually are. And maybe that's because we're not really mindful of the grace that God has given to us, that we're not saved through our works. We're not saved through the reality that, hey, I managed to go through this week without being bitter toward anybody. That's not how we're saved. Because we're saved through faith and Christ's ability to do that, and the fact that he died for us after that, we can say, yeah, you know, I, that was a, it was a tough Thursday for me. Um, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. The truth is that we're here to be to the praise of God's glory, right? That even though I was bitter, I'm still, um, I'm still united with Christ. Right? I still have an inheritance that he's given to me by his grace, right? Um, we're, we're trying either, either way we speak. If we're relying on falsehood, we're trying to present everything as okay. But when we rely on the grace of God in truth, we can express why everything really is okay, which is all that stuff from chapter one, that according to God's great love, according to his mercy, according to his grace, which he lavished on us, 
that's why everything's going to be okay, right? For we are members one of another. And when I when I started to think about this, this one weighed on me pretty heavily because I think that putting away falsehood is a high calling. Putting it away, like that never happens in my life. No, it, it does happen that I engage in some kind of falsehood. And I need to have my mind renewed to not think that it's a white lie or that you know it doesn't really have a great impact. But to understand what Paul says at the end of verse 25, that we are members one of another. What he's saying is that when each of us speak the truth with our neighbor, we are protecting that reality. We are propping that reality up. When we engage in falsehood, what are we doing? We're speaking against it, right? So here's just an image that helps me with this. When Paul says that we're members one of another, what does he mean? Does he mean that we're members of a club? Does he mean that we're members of a family? When Paul elsewhere talks about the church, how does he talk about it in Corinthians and in Romans? He talks about the church as the body of Christ. He's talked about it that way here, right? So it's a little bit different for me to visualize that, hey, I'm supposed to speak the truth with my neighbor who's a member of the same group of people versus this person is a member of the same body as I am. If, um, if your, think about if your hand lied to your head. What if your head, what if your hand just all the time was telling your brain that it was on fire? It's burning, right? And I started acting like my hand, let's say this is me, I started acting like my hand was on fire. What would you think of me? You're crazy. And I could say, wait, but my hand's on fire, though. It's on fire. What would you say? Well, it's not, though. We, we can see that, right? Um, what if my hand was on fire and my hand lied to my head and, say, and said that it wasn't on fire? Well, a lot of damage would be being done, right? And what that's meant to illustrate is just that... Um, Honest communication between the parts of a body is vital. It's vital if there's going to be wisdom uh, acted upon and, and shown, right? Um, but that we're members of the same body. It's not my body. It's not your body. It's Christ's body. And when we engage in falsehood, when we engage in, in speaking the truth, we are promoting the unity. We're promoting healthiness in that body, health in that body. But when we engage in falsehood, we're tearing it apart. And I want us to be able to think about this exhortation in that way. Think about it as relevant to the crucifixion, that when Jesus was there being spat upon and having his beard plucked out and having a crown of thorns beat onto his head and then having all these lashes and then being nailed to a cross, that what he had in mind was that we would be to the praise of his glory. And that requires that we speak the truth with one another, that we put away falsehood. And so we can either help that along or we can work against that, tearing his body apart. Uh, verse 26, we're meant to, um, it says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the, the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. We're meant to uh, go from anger to righteousness, put away anger, and uh, to put on true righteousness. How am I deducing that? Well, be angry and do not sin, right? You can't sin and engage in righteousness at the same time. Um, in James, he says that the, the, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Later in this text, uh, Paul says in verse 31, put away um, all bitterness and wrath and anger, right? So the idea is for us to go from living angry lives to lives that 
do not sin. That's the goal, right? She says, do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. We're supposed to be active against that work of the flesh, against that spirit. The spirit uh, of, of the power of the air wants us to be angry, right? Um, but we're not meant to give him an opportunity. It is through our anger that we're actually allowing the devil to work through us oftentimes. The Apostle John, in his uh, first John, says, you know, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So we have to be mindful of that, that we're either giving the devil an opportunity to accomplish his evil through us because of our anger, or that we're putting anger away and thereby we're destroying the works of the devil like Jesus did. Again, when I think about being angry, sometimes it's just like, hey, I'm just angry. Like, something happened, it made me mad. Makes sense to me. But when I think about the calling and the grace of God, and I think about what God actually wants to do through me as I walk worthy of that call, that helps me to care a lot more and to be encouraged a lot more to not let the sun go down on my anger, which means it's, it inevitably comes, but I've got a war against it, right? And uh, maybe just one more, one more. Uh, verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. This is an interesting one, um, because as you look at this verse, he's talking about theft, no longer steal. But what's the contrast there? Put off stealing, put on labor. Now, if I asked you what the opposite of labor was, would you say stealing? Would that be the first thing that came to your mind? Or would you think... Maybe laziness, right? The opposite of labor is laziness. Over in uh, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 9, uh, Solomon had said there, whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. That's a poetic way of saying that destroying something and being too lazy to take care of something are really spiritually, it's the same thing, right? Imagine one day just uh, no one, everyone stopped taking care of like this meeting space. What would it look like just five, ten years from now? It would be destroyed, right? Okay, what would it look like if somebody just came in here and just threw a bunch of trash everywhere and, you know, maybe punched some holes in the walls? Well, it would look pretty similar, right? The outcome is the same. Laziness and destruction are brothers. And so it's not just that we're meant not to steal, but we're meant to labor, doing honest work, um, with, with his own hands, he says, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So we go from stealing and laziness to labor and generosity. Okay, so just for the sake of time, because I, I know I've gone well beyond what I thought I would, um, I'll wrap this up with uh, the end of that text. He says... In verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Walking worthy of the calling is to go from being grievous to God to being this agent of his redemption. We're meant to go from being grievous to redemptive. And then he gives us this summary, verse 31, 32, right? These are all things that grieve God. Our bitterness, our wrath, our anger, our clamor, our slander, all these are to be put away from you along with all malice, all ill intent toward others, right? But then verse 32, to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, 
as God in Christ forgave you. If we can be these things, kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, you know how, how effective we can actually be in a world of darkness? When somebody, who, who is somebody that needs kindness? Kindness is to offer some kind of service, right? It's those in need. So when someone in need has a child of God come and help in that need, right? That's impactful, is it not? Who is it that needs tenderheartedness? What's those that are downtrodden, those that are overwhelmed? They need sympathy. They need someone to show that they care, right? Maybe someone to listen to them. Maybe someone who can look inward and, and realize like how they relate to them, how they've been there, right? And then, you know, to share, you know, how God has helped them from that. And forgiving one another. I mean, if, if forgiveness isn't self-explanatory, you know, in terms of like our need for that, we need forgiveness. There are all of these disagreements and wars and things like that. Forgiveness is so powerful, right? Um, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you is the renewal of your mind part. It's not just that, um, you know, there are problems in the world, but our core problem, right? The fact that we were children of wrath, God was kind and tenderhearted and forgiving toward us so that we would be the same things, right, toward those around us. All right. Thanks for your attention this morning.